Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we are in Luke chapter 22, and we begin our study in verse 54. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let's begin reading, actually, back in Luke chapter 22, verse 47. It says, while he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and a man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were about him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priest and the captains of the temple and the elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber, swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the hour of darkness. And now verse 54. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed at a distance. Now, if Peter had given Jesus the type of help that he requested in the garden, which was prayer, Peter would not have been in the flesh cutting this man's ear off. And anyway, Peter did not want to disobey Christ, I suppose, and get physical again. But at the same time, he couldn't just stay away completely, so consequently he follows Jesus at a distance. Verse 55. It says, And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. The high priest's home was actually more like a palace with a wall that surrounded a courtyard, and that's where Peter is right here. Verse 56. Then a maid seeing him as he sat in the light and gazing at him said, This man also was with him. That fire that kept Peter warm also gave off enough light to allow this girl to recognize him. 57, but he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. You know, Peter had the courage to cut that man's ear off in the garden, even though that man had plenty of backup. However, here, Peter panics, and he lies when he's confronted by this servant girl. Now, that doesn't make sense until you remember that this battle is spiritual, not physical. This is about denying Christ. This is a spiritual battle. It doesn't make sense that he would do that until you remember that it's a spiritual battle and spiritual boldness comes from prayer, which, of course, is what Peter did not do. He slept. He did not pray. He was not ready. Verse 58. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. After failing the first time, Peter should have gotten out of that place. I mean, it's obvious. It's too tough for him. He can't handle it. And the lesson for us is this. If we cannot handle certain types of temptation, then it's best to stay away from the people, the places, the things that will tempt us in, tempt the, tempt us in those areas. I and mean, if we can't handle it, stay away by all means. Verse 59. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him for he... Now, Galilean spoke with a definite accent. And since Jesus' men were from Galilee, and since no Galilean would have any business at all in the high court or in the court of the high priest in the middle of the night down in Jerusalem. 
well, it was only reasonable to conclude that Peter, who spoke with that Galilean accent, was a disciple of Jesus. That's a logical conclusion. Verse 60, But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. And so, Peter, he got another chance, and he sent that chance away. 61, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny three times. You will deny me three times. Jesus evidently glanced out the window of the palace when he heard the rooster crow. And he caught the eyes of Peter as Peter was denying that he didn't know Christ. Either that or it have happened as Peter was being taken through the courtyard. But either way, Peter got caught in the act of sinning. And notice the response. 62. And he went out and wept bitterly. Do you remember? The reason I wanted to read beginning in verse 47 was to just to remind us of of what happened in the garden, how Judas betrayed Jesus. And do you remember, Jesus looked at Judas too and even spoke to him while he was committing the sin of betrayal and Judas just kept right on sinning. There was no repentance. There was no crying. There was no tears of remorse of any kind. And Jesus looked at Peter and Peter ran off and wept and he repented. And there you see the difference between a saved person and an unsaved person. A saved person, yes, still sins, but feels terrible and repents and confesses. An unsaved person, they just turn their back on God. No saved person turns their back on God. And stays in that condition. 63. Now the men who were holding Jesus mocked him and beat him. Very cruel to pick on anyone for any reason. Christ knows what that feels like. That's what they did to him. And you can bet that Jesus remembers what that feels like. And you can bet he takes note of any time it happens to anyone today. 64. Blindfolded him and asked him, prophesy Who is it that struck you? And they spoke many other words against him, reviling him. They dared Christ to prove that he was the prophet or a prophet. They dared him to prove it. On judgment day, they will have all the proof that they need. They won't be wondering anymore because these soldiers will look into the eyes of the Lord that they mocked. And these soldiers will look at the face that they punched And they will look at the beard that they plucked out. And they will tremble with fear. And they will know, and they will know on that day that they were very foolish. 66. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes. And he led them away to the council. And they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. Now, Jesus had already said that he was the Christ. He's already said that he was the king of the Jews, the son of God. They did not believe him in the past. But they're asking him again. Because they want him to say it again, this time in court. So that they can drag him to the Roman governor and accuse him of treason. Because the religious rulers know that Rome executes anyone who claims to be a rival king to Caesar. That's part of verse 67. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. Jesus, I believe, is alluding to the many times that he asked the religious leaders a question intended to lead them to truth. And they understood the question, but they would not answer because they were not interested in truth. And so many times Jesus asked them questions that brought them face-to-face with reality, face-to-face with truth, and they knew it, but rather than admitting that what Jesus was saying was true, and rather than admitting that they were wrong, they rebelled. And they rebelled because they didn't want to learn, because they hated truth. So Christ is not going to answer their question. He's not going to give them any more truth. 
because he knows they're not really interested in it. 69. But he does say this, From now on the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So whether the believer or the religious rulers believe it or not, doesn't matter. Jesus is still God. Jesus is still God's Son. And they will know it on Judgment Day. They will see Christ on His throne. See, the religious rulers have been running from truth. And they've been turning a blind eye to truth. But on Judgment Day, they will not be able to run from truth anymore. 70. And he all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. And now they have their charge. And now they can indict Jesus before the governor. Now they can ask for the death penalty because he claimed to be a king. And, of course, Jesus knew what was going on and Jesus gave them what they wanted, knowing that they would use it against him. But it doesn't matter because Jesus is going to speak and he's not going to deny himself. And so he said it anyway. And the lesson for us is this. We must do what God wants us to do. And we must say what God wants us to say, even though we know in advance that it's going to mean trouble for us. 71. And they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from, our, from his own lips. Jesus told them the truth. And he did not hold back even to save himself. He gave them the truth. They have truth. Jesus did his job. What they do with the truth, that's up to them. When we live and speak the truth as God's people, we have done our part. Really, there's nothing more that we can do. We've done our part. People will have to make up their own minds about what they will do with the truth that we have given them. Chapter 23. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. Jesus is still popular. And the religious rulers do not want the people to be angry with them for putting Christ to death. So if they can get Pilate to crucify Jesus, the religious rulers figure they have it made. Jesus will be dead, and the people will not blame them. They will blame Rome. So that's why they bring him before Pilate. Verse 2, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. The, The liars, they are lying. Jesus never said, You must not pay your taxes. He said just the opposite, and they know it. Jesus said, Pay your taxes. And notice how these rulers imply to Pontius Pilate that uh, Jesus forbid the Israelites to pay taxes because he was setting himself up as a rival king to Caesar. Look at verse 3. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Now, Pilate may not care about Caesar's honor, but Pilate does care about his own job and his own neck. And Pilate's in trouble with Rome. If he lets someone run around claiming to be a rival king to Caesar, so he wants to know from Jesus' own lips, are you a king? Because that would mean trouble. Verse 4. And Pilate said to the chief priest and the multitudes, I find no crime in this man. Pilate had seen enough rebels in his days to know that Jesus Christ is not one. Besides, the Jews hate Rome. And the Jews hate Caesar. So the idea that they would turn Christ in for being disloyal to Caesar doesn't make any sense. Pilate doesn't buy it. Verse 5. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. Pilate isn't buying their charges. And so their accusations become more and more intense. I'll tell you what, if Jesus walks away from free, a free man... If he walks out of this place a free man and people find out that the rulers tried to get him executed, the rulers are dead. And they know it. So their accusations are becoming more emotional, more intense. Six, when Pilate heard this, 
He asked whether the man was a Galilean. Pilate wants to weasel his way out of this thing. He doesn't want any part of this case. And he thinks that he may have found a way to do that. Verse 7. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent Jesus over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. Pilate did not want to handle the Jesus case. He didn't want anything to do with it because he knew Christ was innocent, but he didn't want to release him and anger the religious rulers. And Pilate was in a tough situation. But that's what happens when you are a leader. You get situations. You have to make tough choices and tough decisions, and some people are going to hate it, and some people are going to dislike you. But that just goes with the territory. And if Pilate didn't want to be involved in things like this, then he should have dug ditches for a living instead of taking the job as a governor. Because a good leader will no doubt anger some people. Verse 8. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him. He was hoping to see some sign done by him. Herod evidently was bored with his jugglers you know, and his magicians and his other court entertainers. And so he wants some fresh entertainment and he figures Jesus can provide that for him. Verse 9. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. <laughs> Jesus would not entertain ungodly Herod. Herod is ungodly. He is unspiritual. He doesn't care one bit about spiritual things. He's asking Jesus all sorts of questions. Jesus will not entertain him. Jesus will not entertain Herod in an attempt to hold his interest. And I'll tell you something else. Christ never commands his church to entertain the unspiritual in order to hold their interest either. And yet that's what happens. That is happening in many places. In Pentecostalism and evangelicalism. I'm not saying everyone. I'm saying it's in a lot of places where the people are entertained. There's always got to be something new Always something different, something fresh to keep the people interested. Some form of entertainment. And they may not call it that, but that's what it is. And the people sitting in the pews get bored, you know, and go someplace else, get ticked off, didn't like the show, didn't like the music, didn't like, you know, the preacher used too many illustrations, they're not enough, and he didn't like the stories. And You know, it's all about entertainment. It's so sickening. And what's really sickening is many churches try to give people that. You know, entertain their interest. Hold their interest till when? That's my question. Until they die and go to hell because they've never been given the pure word of God? Because they've never been told that they need to repent? They've only been entertained, they've never been given the word of God, but only been entertained so that they keep coming back? That's a horrible thing to do. Verse 10. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Well, the religious rulers are in a panic because it looks like Christ might be released. My question is, who's in control here and who's out of control? I know Jesus is shackled, but he's calm. And he's in control because he's right with God. It's the rulers that are in a panic. They're the nervous ones. Verse 11. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in gorgeous apparel, he sent him back to Pilate. So, Jesus would not do tricks for Herod, and he would not answer him. And Herod, I suppose, doesn't like that. He felt slighted, and so he gets Jesus back by having his men mock him. 12. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other after that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. These two moral reprobates find common ground in their sin, and they become friends as a result. People find it easier to be bad when they have somebody to be bad with. They can pat each other on the back, you know, tell each other how wonderful they are. 13. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And so after Herod sends Jesus back to Pontius Pilate, Pilate summons all the Jewish rulers together. Together, they're gonna, He's going to settle this Jesus issue once and for all. 14. 
and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. In other words, Jesus, Pilate says, Jesus is not guilty. He does not deserve to be punished. Pilate is telling the Jewish rulers that they have falsely accused Christ. And he does not because he is innocent. Verse 15. Pilate says, Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Behold, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Pilate appeals to Herod's opinion as further proof that Jesus should be released. That's a mistake. You know, what Herod, that miserable moral reprobate, thinks is right or wrong doesn't matter one bit. Who cares? Herod's opinion doesn't matter at all. The right to be treated fairly comes from Almighty God, not from any man, let alone some fool like Herod. And the lesson for us is this. You, you don't have to appeal to the authority of man for that which you do and for that which you say. In fact, don't do it. Stand on the word of God. If it is right, then do it, whether somebody else agrees with it or not. 16. Pilate says, I will therefore chastise him and release him. Pilate is wrong if he thinks that beating Christ is going to satisfy those bloodthirsty sinners who want Jesus dead. Because it's not. It's not going to satisfy them. And sinning to satisfy an ungodly person doesn't work. It never works. Because they will demand more and more compromise, more and more sin, in order to remain satisfied. 17. Now, he was obliged to release one man to them at the festival. Now, there was an unwritten law in those days. Rome was expected to release one Jewish prisoner during the Passover. 18. But they all cried out. But they cried, excuse me, but they all cried out together, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas. Away with Jesus. In other words, Drive them out of this world. Execute them, is what they are saying. They chose Barabbas to be released instead of Jesus. Someone says, well, if they chose Barabbas to be released, he must have been a wonderful guy. Look at verse 19. Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city and for murder. These rulers are such hypocrites. Such liars. And if you didn't know that before, you should know it now. They demand that Jesus Christ be put to death for rebelling against Rome. Right? That's what they said to Pilate. Put him to death. He deserves to die because he has rebelled against Rome. And now, here, they insist that Barabbas, who really did rebel against Rome, be released. What a bunch of hypocrites. They have just exposed themselves as the liars that they really are. 20. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. So the longer this thing goes on, the more convinced Pilate is that Jesus is innocent. And it's becoming more and more clear to Pilate that the rulers are wicked and just full of envy toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Pilate sees that. 21. But they shouted out, crucify, crucify him. The more they sensed, the more the rulers sensed that Pilate wanted to release Jesus, the more intense and more angry their shouts about crucifying Jesus become. Because they are really in a panic if Jesus gets released. 22. A third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no crime deserving death. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Pilate didn't have to bargain with these Jews. What is he doing? He doesn't have to bargain with them. He didn't need their approval to release Christ. He's the governor. He could have done it. And if he would have been a leader worthy of the title leader, he would have released Christ. 23. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. The religious leaders just would not back down. Not for anything. Nothing but the death of Christ would satisfy them. And they are so loud and so forceful 
that Pilate finally just caves in. 24. So by the, Pilate gave sentence that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, whom they asked for, but Jesus they delivered up to their will. So, they were very hypocritical. And Pilate, he's no leader. A leader does what is right, even when no one else follows. And Pilate was not a leader. He was a follower, a follower of the worst kind, because he follows the crowd even though the crowd is wrong. Even when he knows the crowd is wrong, he follows the crowd. Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never repented of your sins and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, then today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Don't put it off. Because if you die in a state of sin without being forgiven, you're going to hell. And there is no second chance. So my advice to you is to receive Jesus Christ right now and repent of your sin and start living for him. Pray with me. Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I repent of my sin. I invite you to come and be my Lord, be my Savior from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions for me, comments for me, prayer requests, please write me and call me. My address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, 54402-2211. Or you can call area code 715-842-9021. That's 842-9021. You're welcome to join us on Sunday morning. We have a very simple service, lasts about 55 minutes. Communion, the Word of God, and a couple of songs that glorify the Lord. And I teach the Bible verse by verse on Sunday morning, and on Wednesday evening we have a Bible study where I'm going through another book of the Bible verse by verse. You're welcome to join us again. The phone number, information on where we are meeting is 842-9021. Until next week. Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse, reminding you to stay in the Word and stay in prayer. Till next time, so long. Everybody.